I review Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about playing the ultimate game of D&D and other role-playing games. And I'm Deathbringer. Level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon so you'll be informed when we upload new videos. Today we're looking at the latest release from Wizards of the Coast, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I got mine at Target because it was sold out on Amazon. So if you're looking for it, Target is the way to go. You also get 30% off the cover price, and if you have a Target card, good for you. And I'm going to do it differently than some of the other reviewers because I'm going to start at the back of the book. I've noticed in some YouTube reviews people get as far as the first two pages and talk for 20 minutes. I'm going to start at the end of the book and work my way to the front because my favorite stuff is in the back. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is 200 pages. It's glue binding. I would have preferred stitched. I would have also preferred a ribbon. There's also empty pages at the beginning of the book. Why? We could have put charts there. The cover art is great. Some of the interior art is great, like this gnome artificer. I love this. And Tasha playing chess. This is awesome. Chapter 4 is Dungeon Master's Tools, and in my opinion, it is the best. It covers Session 0, running for one player, the social contract, house rules, sidekicks. I love the effects section. Here we have a couple of pages on haunted effects, so you get these descriptions of haunted kind of things. I love this artwork, by the way, but it is really creepy, useful stuff, especially when you're a dungeon master and you have trouble thinking of how to describe something. We get enchanted spring effects and magical mushroom effects. One piece of advice if you're going to use these descriptions, what you want to do is look it up before the game and put it in your Game Master notes so you don't flip through this book. To me, it's a resource for before and after the game, with a few couple of exceptions, like the puzzles. And the puzzles are awesome! I found this so useful. My players love puzzles, but I'm not good at putting them together. I really can't gauge how long it's going to, to take for them to solve it, or if it's too difficult or it's too easy. Here you get the difficulty level, the hints for if your players get stuck, and the solution, which I like to read as the Game Master, because I don't want to have to figure out the puzzle myself. I'm not a puzzly guy. Magical Miscellany. We get a bunch of new spells. Are some of them broken? I don't know. The dungeon dudes will probably figure that out over the next couple of months. There's a part on magical tattoos. I love this concept. In my game, all wizards have their spells tattooed on their body, so they're living spell books. So this is kind of right up my alley. And you get a bunch more magic items, always useful. Chapter 2, Group Patrons. This is a great chapter, especially if you're a newer DM and you, you want some suggestions on how to develop a patron for your party. They describe the different types of patrons that you can have, academics, aristocrats, criminals, guilds, how to develop these contacts. And I'm on record as saying every campaign needs a Gan Dumbledore Kenobi. And if you like this stuff and you need ideas, check out the link below to my video on three NPCs because I cover that material there. Chapter 1, Character Options. Again, working backwards. New feats. Each gives you a plus one ability score raise and allows you to do something cool. Chef allows you to cook food that heals extra hit points during a short rest, which raises the question, does the chef themselves heal? Because I've seen Gordon Ramsay at work and he seems anything but relaxed. And you can make Scooby Snacks that give characters hit point bonuses. Personally, I think cooking should be a skill, not a feat, and you know, it's just, it just seems a little goofy to me. Crusher and Slasher are mirror images that essentially do the same thing. On a nat 20, your opponent is injured and your party members get to attack them with advantage. Skill Expert allows you to double your skill point. I'm not going to go over them all here. It all depends on what kind of campaign you have. Feats are optional. Players love them because they give them extra powers and stat bonuses. I think if you're a new DM, feats can imbalance the game. It's up to you. New classes and subclasses. The Artificer. They're wizards who build stuff. Subclasses include Armorer, Artillerist, and Battlesmith, and you can make a spell gun, be Iron Man, or build Bubo the Owl. Everyone, bards, clerics, barbarians, get new features and subclasses. There are new druid circles, like the Circle of Spores, which I think is weird and cool. But everyone's going to be picking the Circle of Wildfire, because, let's face it, players love fire. You can get your own custom spirit, so now they can have a fire lion. Rangers get a few subclasses. I like the Swarm Keeper because it's weird and quirky. They control insects. I love the idea of a ranger controlling a bunch of angry battle bees, and you can customize your swarm, and there's endless potential for pun names like Buzz Cauldron, Josh Hornet, or Philip Seymour Mothman, and you can put yours below. 
Rogues get a new class feature, Steady Aim, which gives you advantage to hit as a bonus action. They also get two subclasses, Phantom Rogue and Soul Knife Rogue, which are the Goth Rogues and Mind Assassins. The first two pages is the source of all the controversy. Switching skills and subclasses. I have no problem with this, I've done it for years, be a Game Master Fiat, if you're not interested in your character, you want to be something else, you can just swap it out, especially if you are very low level. I call it retconning the character. I will even allow characters to switch classes and we'll just pretend that they were that class the whole time. Now, if they're very high level or they have all this backstory or they're just doing it to get some sort of advantage, then I could see saying no. But for me, I just don't think it's a big deal. The biggest change is that you could swap out your plus two, plus one racial abilities and put them in whatever ability scores you want. Now you can have a dwarf juggler or an elf that's all pumped up and swole. I myself enjoy playing against type, like I dig playing uh, a goblin sorcerer who was taken from his cave and apprenticed to a wizard and he doesn't have dark vision because he was raised in the light and he's super intelligent. Like to me, those type of characters are quirky and cool. Others have complained this makes all the races essentially the same and I I don't really have a good response to this because mathematically it's true. Don't look at the 3 to 18 ability score, look at the bonuses to the right because that's what really counts. Plus 3, plus 2, plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1. They're statistically identical. Yes, an elf with a 17 dexterity will make it up to 18 and get that plus 4 bonus at 4th level, whereas a human will need to wait till 8th level. But here's the thing. One point on this die doesn't make a statistical difference over the lifetime of your character or the lifetime of your campaign. It's just insignificant. Which means all races are essentially the same. They get a bunch of pluses and no penalties. In the first edition, being an elf, dwarf, or halfling gave you significant advantages on low levels, but you couldn't go higher than 6th to 8th level. Only humans could make it up to 10th, 15th, or 20th level. For better or worse, Tasha's Cauldron is bringing us closer to what I call the point of RPG singularity. That's where Every lineage is essentially the same, and you can be whatever you imagine to be because statistically, mechanically, there's no difference. Create your own custom lineage. On page 8, it says, give yourself plus 2 to an ability score, dark vision or a proficiency or a feat if you play with them, and now you can make a dwarf. It's a combination elf, dwarf, and it's just as good as an elf or a dwarf. On one hand, I miss the idea that you take a penalty in one area to get a bonus in another area. On the other hand, if you want to play a mermaid or a medusa, go nuts. It's your game, and if that's how you have fun and your DM is cool with it, who am I to stand in the way? Overall impressions. Is Tasha's Cauldron going to significantly change your game, and is it broken? And the answer to that is, that depends, and kinda. First, the pets. There are a lot of pets. Boobo owls, fire lions, beastmaster companions. Then there's the spirits, bestial spirits, fae spirits, fiendish spirits. Then there's the sidekicks. This is a lot of stuff to keep track of. Between player actions, bonus actions, multiple attacks, spell effects, then a pet, then a sidekick, we're talking four to five or six moves in one round. Spellcasting sidekicks are an especial nightmare because they can effectively double the length of the spellcaster's turn. This isn't a problem if you play with two people, but I play with six to eight, and a round would take 20 minutes. If I allowed pets and sidekicks, I would roll for them, and by roll for them, I would calculate the average damage they inflict, toss some dice behind my screen, and pretend that's what I roll, because my job is to keep the game moving. If you're a new DM, I'd caution against anything that gives players extra turns because it will slow your game exponentially. Second, clerics. I've always felt that the cleric is the most powerful class in the game because other things like a magic user or a fighter, they attack other things, but the cleric allows everybody else to make their attack by virtue of healing them. The cleric's job is to essentially distribute hit point coupons. You get a hit die, you get a hit die, you get a hit die. Peace clerics can use Bomb of Peace to heal multiple allies. Twilight Domain clerics can cast Twilight Sanctuary to heal multiple allies. Between these spells, potions of healing, and the chef making the Scooby Snacks, everyone heals to full hit points after just a short rest. 
Personally, I think having unlimited access to healing destroys the suspense of the game because you know you can't die. I like a game where death is lurking around every corner, where if I make a wrong decision, a wrong move, or I have a bad die roll, that I could be killed. When I dungeon master, I'm not looking to kill the player characters, but I want them to have that feeling that their choices matter and that they could be killed. So personally, I wouldn't allow the Peace Domain in Twilight Clerics, and nothing says I have to include them. All the rules in this book are optional. Think of Tasha's as a salad bar. You don't have to eat the olives if you don't want them. And if your players complain, just put the master in Dungeon Master and tell them no. Tasha's Cauldron is a must-have if you're a completist and only play with official Wizards of the Coast approved material. The rules are optional, so you can customize them to your campaign. It's another step closer to D&D Singularity, a raceless, classless, point-by system where everyone is a spellcaster and characters nearly never die. It's not indispensable, but it's useful, and I appreciate the puzzles, which are great. Final verdict, three out of four cauldrons. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and share it on social media. Questions or comments, you can put them below. Also below, you can find a link to our Facebook group and Patreon page where you can get an extended version of this video as well as a copy of all my house rules. Once again, for Dungeon Craft, I'm Professor Dungeon Master. Thanks so much for stopping by. I'll see you soon. And until then, may all your rolls be 20s. Deathbringer again. I used to date Tasha, but broke up with her because of her temper. That's the problem with witches. They're always flying off the handle. Hey, if you've got a better joke, put it in the comments. Otherwise, click on more Dungeon Craft.